Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for being with us on the Many Hats uh, Club Isolation Con, or if you've just joined us, great to have you here. Um, please do keep donating. The uh, GoFundMe link is via the Many Hats Club Twitter. I think we're approaching about £7,000 nearly, which is absolutely awesome. So please keep contributing to that. Um, next up, a guy I know pretty well. So uh, over to the one and only Harry McLaren. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, everyone, for having me. Everyone that's involved in the setup has been very smooth. Brilliant so far, some great speakers. So I'm going to be running through a session for you today uh, called Becoming a Defender. We're going to be focusing very much on um, entering into a blue team or teams and types of roles you can expect within some of those teams, the kind of competencies that are relevant to them. So I think it's going to be appropriate if you're getting into the industry, you want to get into it, but also if you're looking to advance your career or think about what's next, hopefully there'll be some good content for you to, for you too. So this is... A little bit about me. I'm a product lead at Adama and I look at, look after detection and response. So that's all of our services and products within that area. I'm an alumnus of Edinburgh Napier University, so where I started and where my main passion for cybersecurity started. The co-founder along with Stu of Cyber Scotland Connect, um, a great Scotland-based community for cyber security and information security professionals, practitioners. Um, and you can see me on Twitter at CyberHaribu. Um, I've listed my previous roles just to kind of give you an understanding that you know, I've pretty much always been in the blue team space. Um, first of all, working in security operation centers and incident investigation, later on more security engineering. So building the tools that defenders use to defend their networks and respond to active cyber threats. I've then consulted uh, across mostly large and um, very large enterprises of building and enhancing their security operations capabilities. And now I focus on product development um, in the same area for Adama. So what I'm going to be covering shouldn't be more than 40 minutes, give or take, keep try and keep on schedule. I'm going to first cover just a couple of slides on why it's why it's still really important, defensive cybersecurity, why um, blue teamers are still very relevant, still very important. Talk a little bit about what security operation centers are, what their purpose is, what component parts are within them. A little bit about the types of careers you can see in security operation centers. And then I'm going to focus on the competencies, the competencies that defenders need to be successful and hopefully have a big impact on the industry. So first and foremost, um, two, two stats from, uh, I think I collated them from three or four reports over uh, 2019 and these were just two of many but two of the largest as far as financial impact of the importance to, sorry to highlight the importance of cybersecurity professionals so uh, BEC business email compromise um, things like you know phishing emails and people being tricked fundamentally into doing things that you know, it's like uh, transferring money changing payroll details this is roughly 1.7 billion a year but is dwarfed by by its uh, bigger brother ransomware. Ransomware has been around for quite some time, but it's just been growing at an incredible rate. Everything from uh, not pet here, which wasn't true ransomware, but still kind of counts in this category, through to the um, you know weaponized and commercialized platforms now that cyber criminals use to spread ransomware throughout the world. So you know just with those two combined, you're talking about nine billion a year of financial impact. So um, yeah, being uh, on the defensive side of the world is is not going away anytime soon. It's a very very valid career and can be very rewarding when you think about the impact that these kind of numbers could have on businesses. This is also recognized by the World Economic Forum. So they yearly publish a fantastic survey on risk. Now risk isn't the coolest thing in the world, but it is quite interesting when you think about it in relation to cybersecurity. So this is the top right hand quadrant. This is where they believe that some of the most impactful and if you look at the axis, it's a, yeah, impact and likelihood. So these are some of the most worrisome things that businesses should be worried about. And you'll notice there that cyber attacks is right up there along things like human-made environmental disasters, natural disasters, biodiversity loss, weather crisis. So this is this is not something that um, boards are you know, forgetting about these days, it's starting to become more and more prominent. It's up there on the risk register for all major companies and it's impacting them and making businesses go out of, out of business. So yeah, so here we are in the likelihoods, we've got data fraud and theft and cyber attacks at six and seven and an impact uh, six and eight. So if you're thinking from a, you know, 
a board, shareholders' perspective, these things are absolutely critical and on the top of their list of things to worry about. Therefore, it's really important that there are well-trained and competent people in your profession that can help them respond to these things appropriately. So let's talk about what a SOC is. Now, I'm going to use the word SOC to mean Security Operations Centre, and I'm going to essentially use it as a synonym for security operations full stop. So not everyone has a SOC, but they'll usually have someone responsible for the types of roles and responsibilities that a SOC does have. So that might just be one person, might be outsourced, but I'm going to kind of refer to all of that right now as SOC, um, as it's my background. So what, what is a SOC? Well, fundamentally, a SOC is to prepare for, detect and respond to cybersecurity threats. So preparation is making sure that you've established people, processes and technology to support the two main things you do, which is to detect and respond. So that preparation is key because you don't want to be preparing um, while doing. So you don't want to be preparing or responding in a way when something's kicked off. You need to do that before the bang, before it's actually occurred as best you can. Um, detection is all about proactive monitoring. So making sure that you understand when you're being attacked. Um, if you've listened to any of the other talks today, or indeed, you know, read anything about cybersecurity, you'll know that um, prevention, you know, protection uh, is never going to work 100% of the time. There are always going to be threat actors, whether they're internal or external, that can get through your defences, whether they're layered, whether they're next gen and supported by ML and AI, doesn't matter. There's no such thing as 100% security uh, in protection. So you have to have capabilities to detect and then respond to those incidents. So detections, about proactive monitoring, and then triaging and understanding, well, um, is this threat or this activity worse than, the, what, than another one that's happening at the same time? Where should I be focusing my time and my resources? Response is then how to then respond to what you've detected. So you think that you know, you've, a phishing email has hit the inbox of everyone in your executive committee. Okay, what do you do about it? And this is again where that preparation is critical so that you have playbooks and procedures in place so that for all of the expected types of incidents that you might come across, you have prescribed and um, thought out what exactly you should do. You know, who should you contact in IT to get them to shut down um, your exchange server? Who should you contact to, you know, revoke some of your API keys in your AWS cloud because they're being abused um, by, you know, a ransomware bot? Um, and so they're the, they're the key main pillars. It's detection and response and wrapped around that is preparation. That is what security operations is fundamentally about, at least from my perspective. So what are the type, typical types of roles that you would see within a SOC? So these are ones that I've personally experienced and how um, when, I've, when I've built SOCs that we've typically um, framed them in these, in these tiers. So in the first tier, um, often described as tier one, sometimes a mixture of tier one and two, your, your entry role is often a support analyst. This is, could be considered almost kind of like a, a help desk type role. They're typically doing things like password resets or you know, responding to the most basic of um, alerts or inquiries within security. The, the next role, also sometimes an entry role, is a security analyst. So at this point at that tier one, they're often triaging um, large volumes of alerts or potential security incidents. And they're trying to just work out at that first tier, is this a true positive? Is this something I'm worried about? And if it is something I'm worried about, how worried should I be? So that is then likely to then be sent to a second tier or escalated to some form of incident management function, depending upon their analysis. That's often then augmented with a senior analyst or senior security analyst. And they'll often, you know, you might have say a two or three to one mapping there. So you might have a senior analyst sit above or, or with a team of other security analysts just to provide that additional experience and guidance on the more complicated tickets or issues or alerts. In that second to third tier, this is where you're often starting to see people specialize more. So you might have a person that's specifically um, responsible for supporting incidents or to be an incident investigator. So they don't react to normal tickets coming through the system, but they get pulled in for specific incident triage. So when there is a security incident, how bad is it? What's the impact? How do we contain it and recover from that security incident? You've then got threat hunters. These are people that proactively don't wait for an alert saying they've been attacked, but they go and hunt throughout the environment, throughout the logs and the metrics that are being collected to try and actually uncover um, evidence of an attack or evidence of an attacker, you know, trying to collate information. 
about your organization. And then they try and feed into a loop of development, which is then to proactively create detective and responsive controls so that these new techniques, techniques and tactics can be identified early and hopefully you can then mitigate those threats. You've then got this role called a SOC specialist. These aren't um, in every SOC, but in the SOCs that I've worked in, this is often somebody who's um, a, a true SME, in particular one or, or, or a few areas. So we might have um, a big data specialist. So for us, that would be Splunk. Or you might have a specialist specifically in vulnerability management. And if that responsibility sits within the SOC, that person will often have been an analyst or incident investigator, but has then become a true SME in that technology and is then responsible for it within the SOC. So it's, a, it's often an interesting role, an interesting place to kind of evolve into if you've had a very particular interest. So it might be in um, a suite of technologies, like it might be you've become a bit of a, a Cisco specialist because you've become an expert in their firewalls and their IDS, IPS, their CASB and other tooling. And then at the management tier, this is where you start to see roles like shift leader. They're often not particularly technical, but are there more of a um, supervisory role. Um, SOCs often run in a 24 by 7 configuration, so they're there to feed and water the people side, make sure that people arrive on time, that they're doing their responsibilities correctly, that they have the right workload. And then you've got more specialisms like incident management. So this is typically a person who's responsible when an incident does get kicked off in ensuring that all of the right steps are taken to mitigate that incident and respond to it in a you know, pre-programmed and procedural driven way. And then finally, often you have a SOC manager or service manager, and they sit above all of these roles and they face off to the business. So they will own things like service level agreements or OKRs, um, which are uh, objectives and key results. You know, they'll, they might hold the targets. Um, they'll be responsible for, you know, perhaps promotions, training budgets, making sure everything fits together correctly, that you have the right number of security analysts to threat hunters, that new technology coming into the SOC isn't going to overwhelm, uh, you know, your tier ones or tier twos. And they'll also be usually responsible for pushing through programs of change to drive efficiencies within the SOC or to, you know, enhance their capabilities, perhaps. And so I'm not going to cover the responsibilities of all those roles because of the time constraints, but I'm going to focus on that tier one and two. So these are some of the most common responsibilities you find in that tier one and two level. So this is typically for your, your analyst or senior analyst roles, um, but not necessarily exclusively. So as I mentioned, so that fundamental security monitoring and event triage, that is, you know, being reactive to an event of interest comes into the SOC. Uh, you know, someone, this account has failed to log in three times is that a bad thing? And they're there to go, well, actually, that's a service account. It does that on the 30th of every month because of a script that we can't seem to get them to update. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Or no, that's happening across all of our database servers. That's not normal. So the triage and step then is going to be that escalation. And that's the next responsibility. So incident escalation and incident support is to make sure that the incident management team and the specialists then jump on the right things. So at that top level tier, that those specialists have very, you know, they're, they're, they're often quite rare within the business. They're expensive as far as salary. So you're not going to have many of them, but their, their skill set needs to be pointed in the right direction. And that's often the responsibility or a co-responsibility of the analysts. Supporting service transitions. So as new services come into the, the SOC, the security operations team, they need to you know, be able to help the project, help the team move that in so it becomes part of their business as usual operation and then continual improvement. So that covers the full people process technology. They should always be looking iteratively to improve upon their job role. And that, that, that goes for all of the roles within a SOC. You always wanna be looking at how you can drive improvements to the processes, to the, the people themselves, to their training, how they're you know, onboarded, and the technology, is the technology tuned? Is it up to date? Is it doing its job correctly? And then finally, they often support management reporting. So pulling reports out of JIRA, ServiceNow, Splunk, whatever, and actually reporting that up so that it can be combined into a pack for management. So that might be number of events per second that we process, number of tickets that we hit our 20 minute SLA on, how many incidents did we support, um, you know, how many data sources are in scope, what's our coverage gap for our tooling. Uh, and it really could be so many different things. It very much depends sock to sock. Okay, and so now getting into the meat of it, we're now going to talk a bit about competencies um, or skills. I call them competencies, it's what we call them at Dharma. 
and we've recently gone through a big body of change to really think about how we look at job roles and how we bring people into the business so some of these slides are built on that kind of six months of work that we did that i was also involved in and supported and these are very much from my perspective and from some of the people within adama's perspective it's not an exhaustive list nor is it a checklist you shouldn't feel that all of these things have to be achieved for you to get an entry position or, or go up to the next rut they're there to try and give guidelines and give um something for people to consume when they're thinking about well where are my gaps where are my competency gaps now we split them into two key areas and one is technical um which should be relatively straightforward to explain what that means. Uh, the second is behavioural, which I'll get to after, but behavioural competencies are what we've introduced and it was us attempting to distill down what key behaviours or in some respects soft skills, uh, which isn't the best word for them, which is why we chose behavioural, do we look for in people that we hire? Um, and as you know, 90% of people that work with us are defenders, it's very relevant obviously to the, the roles and responsibilities I've just mentioned. So some of the technical competencies, I don't think you're going to find anything here that you don't necessarily already know, but you know they're, they're, they're here for, for you to review and maybe consider if you don't have some of these, if you might want to look into getting them, depending on your type of career choices or specialisms. We've got the fundamentals, which are networking. If you're sitting in a security operations center and you start to see alerts coming from networking equipment, whether that's a, a WAF, whether that is your, your, your routing and switching infrastructure, or you know your firewalls, your proxies, your VPNs, and you start to see subnetting information, but don't know what subnet is, or you don't know how to go and use a subnet calculator, because you know if you're not networking admin, you may not be able to do that in your head. You know, there's going to be challenges in, in how successful you're likely to be in triaging those types of incidents. You have to have that underlying knowledge of the basics of the TCP IP networking stack, for example, to understand the handoffs between each layer up to from the application down to the actual physical network. You don't need to be an expert, but you do have to have a handle on it. And the same goes for endpoint. You know, I'm a predominantly Windows and Mac OS user. I have implemented and managed Linux lots within the server space, never used it as a desktop system. I've played around with a lot of virtualized and physical systems and dabbled in containerization. But that breadth of, of experience really helps me when, if I get an alert saying that um, there's a, I don't know, let's say a, a Kerberos vulnerability on an endpoint, and I actually go and re look up that vulnerability and it says it only applies to Windows servers but the endpoint's the Linux box, that instantly helps me triage and go, that is likely to be a false positive. It's unlikely that that Linux box has a Windows vulnerability in its implementation of Kerberos. So that's why it's important to have understanding of endpoints. And that extends to mobile as well, um, although typically you're gonna get a lot less alerting from your mobile infrastructure, especially with BYOD type things, um, but that's that's not the case all, all the time. Um, containerization, um, a key area to start to explore when it comes to endpoints and servers because things are starting to get more ethereal and just running within a certain uh, you know space within like a, a kubernetes cluster or similar and they have different requirements and different attributes than your more traditional virtualized or physical infrastructure that are worth paying attention to malware malware is never going away anytime soon it's existed for decades and will continue to it's under, it's good to understand the different types so you know is it a worm is it a polymorphic virus does it spread simply via uh, a dropper via a phishing email and then download and live off the land in memory and not actually download any malicious binaries itself what the types of patterns that we're seeing in malware at the moment you know are we seeing big uh, you know, rootkit, zero day type approaches, or are we actually just seeing exploitations of PowerShell being poorly implemented and managed via GPO? What are the types of tools are out there that we can research? Things like Virus Total are a great place to start, although there's an absolute incredible amount of resources in the virus and research space. Honey pots, fileless malware, as I mentioned, like living off the land, all of these things are important to, again, not be an expert in, but have an understanding of, so that as you start to triage the events and incidents that come into your system, that you can correctly infer behaviors, infer impact. You know, if you, if you have an alert for something that's wormable within your environment, and you also happen to know that you have vulnerabilities or you're not patched much in your Windows estate, and you get an alert for a worm, that's very different to 
getting an alert for a browser add-in on one computer that's just a bit of you know potentially unwanted program so that, that kind of thing is important um, tactics and techniques this is a uh, not certainly not a new area of research but it is being increasingly uplifted by the kind of work from MITRE with the attack framework and the common controls from the CIS and in you know, a lot of this is building on some of the work by Lockheed Martin and the original um, cyber attack kill chain that they published. All of this is really important for starting to understand and be in the mindset of the attacker or attackers, considering that the phases they go through when they do reconnaissance, when they look to build and weaponize things to attack you, when they actually execute attacks and compromise and then move laterally. And then understanding at the next level down, but well, what are the actual common techniques used? So if an attacker has actually managed to get a, you know, a foothold within your environment, perhaps in your perimeter. How are they likely to try and move to get better privileges? How are they likely to then try and elevate those privileges and take action and try and get hold of your intellectual property or your, you know, some of your key databases with user information? When you understand those techniques, you can then start to understand that when you uncover an attack in progress or you're tracking a, a and a, something that's post-attack, you can start to follow it because you understand how the attacker is likely to work. And the research in this area is fascinating because it's built upon a community of, a very broad community of people within industry that are actually telling them, well, this is actually how we got compromised. And what we found after doing six months of research and pulling apart our logs and our PCAPs is that they did this and they used this particular attack. That's fascinating. Well, now we're going to include it in our attack model so that everyone who uses it can go, ah, if you want to make sure that doesn't happen to you, you need to do these configuration changes. You need to harden your controls in this area. You also need these detective and responsive controls in your SOC to know that if it happens, et cetera, et cetera. So an understanding of attack is tactics and techniques is a really beneficial thing to know as a defender. It really gets you in the mindset all the way down to the tooling level of how an attacker might actually compromise and attack your network. And then finally, and we'll, we'll in pretty much any technical discipline serve you in good stead, that is, is some light ex programming and database experience. I'm not meaning full on, you know, um, computer science, you know, I'm a developer type thing. You do not have to be a developer to be a good defender and work in cybersecurity, but some light knowledge of something like, you know, a scripting language like Python or Go, uh, again, basic understanding of a pro of the programming life cycle, especially a secure programming life cycle, and then the types of tooling often used in, say, um, continuous integration, continuous delivery tooling, so version control, configuration management. Having ex some light experience in all these areas will only stand you in good stead, either for building your own tools and or scripting your own tools for automation, for efficiency, or for trying to uncover weaknesses in other people's code or application security practices and database understanding, so SQL, NoSQL, and big data tooling. Again, if you can manipulate information, especially at scale using big data, you will be able to be a much more successful analyst because you're able to analyze big data sets at speed rather than trying to you know, pull it into Excel or um, you know, wrap some kind of wrangling using grep. If you actually understand how to load that into a database or load it into an indexed um, MapReduce system that you can then query at, at scale, you know, you're, you're likely to be establishing practices that stand you in much better stead than constantly having to hack a solution together using Excel or similar. So there's some a very broad range of technical competencies that I believe are really important for defenders. As I said, depending on where you want to focus, that you may, they may not all be relevant. But I consider that this is a, a foundational set, if you will, uh, for a good defender, especially working in a SOC or SOC type environment, um, and think that they, you know, they really do help you be successful in that area. So. The second side, behavioral competencies. There's quite a lot on this slide. It's not the, it's not the most attractive, but we, we identified eight behavioral, behavioral areas that we wanted to you know, look for in our employees and look for in our defenders. And you know, depending on the role, we look for light to an increasing level of knowledge or skill in these areas. So for an analyst, we don't expect them to have a huge amount of business insight at that level in their career, but we do expect them to be an engaging communicator because they're often dealing with you know customers people within the business 
Um, but for a manager, you know, we do expect them to be, you know, an innovative thinker and a collaborative partner to a higher level than, again, we would someone starting early in their career. So these try to articulate some of the key behaviours that we look for and try to nurture as well, because that's one of the things that's important to point out, especially as somebody that I, I do a lot of hiring and a lot of interviewing. We don't expect people and no one should expect somebody to come a fully formed product a fully formed version of themselves no one is we're all on our own journey we're all learning by doing and we're often learning in response to an environment that is incredibly hostile you know we we, we are defenders because we are being attacked and it's often easy to forget that we are constantly trying to push against a load of people with almost infinite resources that want to undo our work they want us to not be successful they want us to fail every day every attack they make they want us to fail at our job and so we're constantly pushing back against that and some of these behaviors i think really help instill um things like learning mindset personal responsibility performance driven these things help push us when we exhibit these behaviors to push back against those attackers and often succeed in fending off their attacks or responding to them and i think that's really important um, so just get my 15 minute warning. So I will make sure to, to keep the pace going. Um, so I'm not going to talk through each behavioral competency. I think they're relatively self um, explanative and the, all these slides will be shared. But I'm now going to cover one final area, which I, I didn't mention, but it kind of feeds into this overall picture of the behaviors and things. And that is emotional intelligence. Now, emotional intelligence is kind of a buzzword. It can often be misused and uh, it certainly shouldn't be used as a, I guess, a, a tracking tool, you know, to, to give people scores in each area and, you know, fire people or discipline them if they're not exhibiting them. But I do think it's a really useful kind of five point system to consider when thinking about yourself. So one of the, the key things that all of this is hinged upon is self-awareness. So the ability to actually look at yourself, your behaviors, your drivers, the thing, your, your moods, your motivators, and, and, and assess yourself, not against others, but against, was, was that right? Did I maybe respond to my colleague, to my manager, to my customer, because I was actually in a bad mood? Or was I right? And was my motivator actually no, what they were suggesting was dangerous and it was important for me to call them out on it. Self-awareness is a really key and foundational component of all emotional intelligence because without it, the rest kind of doesn't work. Self-regulation, so that when you actually have some awareness and you go, I'm really frustrated or angry or sad and you're feeling pushed to do or act in a way that perhaps is quite damaging to somebody else or yourself, are you able to maybe then pull it back and go, oh, Maybe I shouldn't go and shout at that person and for being an idiot when actually I made that mistake myself six months ago. Maybe I should just go for a walk and then afterwards ask them if they need some help on understanding what happened. You know, what is your what is your motivation and are you able to actually bring motivation to the party when you're having a bad day? So that is not just, you know, trying to be perfect. It's it's a frivolous. Um, exercise to try and do that but actually thinking using that self-awareness to go I actually think I could cope with that situation better how can I do that you know self-improvement I think is a really positive thing when it's not done obsessively and when it's not done to the detriment of others you know emotional intelligence and all these things it's not about you going ah I'm better at that than that person it's going well, a month ago, I dealt with that situation very poorly because I wasn't taking care of myself very well and I kept, you know, uh, undersleeping and I was knackered. But I've made some improvements in the last month and I responded to that situation much better. That's great. That's a really good thing and you should reward yourself for doing that. Um, the next one is empathy and empathy is a massively overlooked thing. Empathy is fundamentally the ability to put yourself in someone else's position and an emotional state and consider is that why they responded in that way? Is that why they said that to me? Were they actually really upset and were, they were being they were being poorly articulate? They weren't self-regulating and they weren't being self-aware. And then doing it to yourself as well sometimes and being a bit kinder to yourself. It's really easy to, you know, be really hard on yourself and go, oh, you did that wrong, you know, even with self-awareness and kind of going, you should improve at that, you're crap at that. But empathy can extend to yourself and just being like, you know what? I think I did okay, actually. 
because I'm working really hard and I had a really tough time and self-isolation sucks, I'm going to give myself a, a, a bit of a, a bit of an easy time. It's okay that I didn't complete that LinkedIn learning course or learn a new language. I'm just going to empathize and go, nah, I'm a, it's a bit sad being indoors all the time. It sucks. So I'm just going to chill out. And then finally, social skills. And obviously these, some people have natural predispositions to be, to have social skills. Some people have learning disabilities or, dis, or uh, physical disabilities that make being social very difficult for them. And these things should be acknowledged and awareness driven for them. But for people that um, don't have, I guess, a, a natural uh, or biological reason, it's the ability of kind of going, did I respond negatively to that? Was that actually just a joke? You know, this kind of maintaining this line between things that are reasonable and, and okay socially to be offended about because they were offensive and things that are perhaps something that maybe I should just let go because it's actually okay and it was meant with no malice and it was actually just about building friendship and relationships. So I think that's a really core cool and important thing as well. But anyway, they're the kind of five components of emotional intelligence, or they are by one uh, or a collection of researchers. There's different interpretations of it. But we're getting close to the end now. So, and I do wanna leave time for questions if there are any. So I'm gonna now just move on to the resources section. Um, these hyperlinks obviously don't work on your screen, but the slides will be uploaded to SlideShare and shared in whatever way um, the uh, Isolation Con want to distribute them. Uh, these are just a few of the resources often share. Some are relevant to this talk, some are relevant to other things I'm really interested in. And there's, there's tons of research and resources out there about you know, skills and competencies, about you know, certs versus courses versus, versus experience. And, and fundamentally, all of those things feed into being successful in your career and being a good defender. Um, all of them have their place. Uh, I don't believe any are you know, rubbish. I don't believe any are the only way forward. But I do think that all of them should be weighted. And if they help you get to where you're going, that they should be, you know, pursued and pursued, you know, structured in a structured plan, and in a way where you kind of seek help and get it from the community at large. Um, so then finally, uh, that's the end of my talk. Uh, as I said, Harry McLaren, I work at Adama. Please do reach out if you've got any questions, or if you want to talk about well, anything really quite approachable. Uh, Cyber Scotland Connect, um, one of the things that I do uh, along with Stu and a number of other of our moderators, we've got our event coming up at the end of the month, obviously a virtual event, so do check that out. Uh, it should be a good one. I believe we've got uh, a few awesome speakers. And yeah, that's it really. So if there are any questions, I will uh, I'll answer them, although I realize I probably need to join the Twitch stream to see them. <laughs> Awesome, thanks, Harry. Uh, Mikey, do we have any? Did we have anything on Twitch? Um, we've got, I would say, six, seven minutes. So a quick look. Just give me a tick while I sw switch between my seventeen different screens. Um, uh, let's have a quick look up there. Not a great deal. I mean, so Harry, your your testimonies are brilliant. I really love listening to you speak, and your experience is brilliant. Um, what about the? Th have you got any thoughts on around the idea of the, the the security analysis role in general and how people can get through it? Because I hear stories. We've spoken about this loads and loads of times over the last couple of years. Around, it's a tough job, right? It yeah. can be a tough job. You are mm. frontline triage. Any tips on how people can survive that kind of role? Yeah, I think I'd answer that in in two ways. One is at the individual level. So. Uh, I was a uh, senior security analyst and, you know, did shift work and did all those things. And I would definitely say, you know, the basics of self-care, shift work sucks um, for everyone who does it, uh, especially uh, if, you're, if you're dealing in high stress situations, which security operations often is. Um, so, you know, make sure that when you're on your downtime that you actually do feed and water, you know, your own emotional um, self. You know, go go for walks, meditate if that's your thing, game if that's your thing, but, you know, look after yourself. Um, during your shifts, um, take your breaks. I was did, did never did this, and I suffered for it. But, you know, go, go for your breaks, go for your walks, you know, um, do your best to limit caffeine where possible. <laughs> uh, I say this as a person who finished yeah. their full-time degree while working full-time shift work. It was a bad call 
and I regretted it deeply and um, as it took me four months to recover from doing it yeah. but you know when you find yourself importing caffeinated chewing gum to stay awake you need to make some changes to the way you're managing your life would it Fair enough. Be, I'd right. say there quickly sorry sorry Harry um, great great answer thank you for that um, thank you very much for uh, to crypto cypher for co uh, collating a couple of other questions from the room which I missed are there any intro certs that you'd recommend for defenders? Um, yeah, sure. So I think uh, there's there's lots out there, and I definitely wouldn't just kind of go. There's there's definitely one, and that's all we would look for. Um, I think Security Plus from CompTIA is reasonable. Um, I don't think it's too high level to be useless. I don't think it's too hard not to be considered around the entry level. Um, if you, as long as you've got. A background with some of the fundamentals of networking and some of the other things I mentioned, a security plus, a really good step forward. There's some industry certs in specific technologies that can be useful if you're trying to join or joining a SOC that specifically works with Splunk or with you know other products. So there are a lot of foundational learnings and certs specifically for those vendors, but I would only do that if you know it's going to be beneficial for your role. Um, but yeah, security plus would be the one for me personally if you've already got uh, some networking foundations if not then networking plus is probably where you want to start okay fair enough great great answer sec plus seems to be really popular you know we used to hear things about CISP and being banded around and then oh you must have CISP or you must have oscp and you must have this that, and the other yeah. but actually sec plus seems to be a really well balanced <laughs> yeah. cert and, and i think you know CISP and it is definitely not a, an entry level cert that, i mean you've got to have five years on the job experience just to be considered for it or four years if you've done a degree so it's definitely entry level oscp is entry level but for you know pen testing and red teaming i would say more it, i mean it's, it's very beneficial as a defender to know how they're going to attack you but for me it's more important that you can do your job as a defender well yeah. than necessarily actively go out and do and orchestrate pen pen tests or, or red teaming type activity yeah totally agree okay harry um I'm kind of still his due thunder because he, he was your um, your wingman on this. But thank you very much indeed for your time. Always appreciate it, mate. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Harry. And we'll uh, yeah, we'll see everyone for the next talk in a, in a few minutes. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Appreciate it.